Got it. All right. Looks like we got it. All right. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> looks like we're a couple minutes early here. That's all right. Uh, turn this off here. Just give me one second. Uh, there we go. Okay. All right. Hi there, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining up. We're a couple minutes ahead here. Uh, so we'll the rest of the folks show up. Got a little something neat to show you. So today's program is called The Age of Humans. And we're really going to be talking about sort of the, the rise of humans, the, the dawn of our ancestors. And uh, when we get to that here in just a minute, uh, we're going to actually kind of finish uh, right about where we start. Uh, which is why uh, you can see I'm, I'm all dressed up for the day here as uh, sort of cave Sean. But will we let everybody else join in? We're going to show you this. This is something we're not quite going to get to today. We'll talk about a little more in the future. Uh, this is a gourd canteen. So uh, since we're in October, the month of Halloween, I imagine uh, you guys like carving pumpkins, jack-o'-lanterns. Yeah, well, this is a sort of a cousin of our, our jack-o'-lantern where a pumpkin like you'd use for Halloween wouldn't work very well for this. This is made of a, a very close relative to that plant called a gourd. It's very hard. If we put it next to the microphone, maybe you can hear that. And hollow it out and clean it up and use it as my water bottle. Whoops and it splashes sometimes. So this is something that our ancestors, our human ancestors figured out how to do. The, uh, the things we're gonna be talking about today, we don't think quite figured that, that part out yet. So it uh, looks like it's, it's one o'clock, so Thank you everybody for, for coming along, for joining in today with, uh, with me here at Colossal Fossils. Uh, if you haven't been on a program with me before, my name is Sean, I go by Cave Sean. Uh, the Mammoth Hunter works, Sean, whatever, uh, whatever works for you. Uh, here at Colossal Fossils, I am uh, I'm an experimental archeologist. So what that means, what I do for the museum is I take uh, an artifact, something that uh, our our ancestors made and used and left behind that we found. Um, I make a reproduction of it, uh, something like this. And then I take this out and I use it. So I, the clothes that I'm wearing here, I actually go out into the real world where there's other people that can see me and I wear this stuff, I use these tools, and I do it to learn more about how our ancestors did things, why they did it a certain way, maybe why certain materials were favored over others, and we can actually learn all kinds of things about our ancestors by doing that. Now, today, we're not quite gonna get to our uh, direct homo sapien ancestors, people that you would recognizes your great, 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 however many greats, grandparents. We're gonna talk about what came before. Uh, we call today's program the age of humans. It's, it's really gonna be more focusing on the rise of humans, where we come from as a, as a group, as a species. So to start with, I uh, want everybody who's watching, show me your thumbs. You guys all have thumbs? Yeah, I see some good thumbs, all right. So. All of us are primates. Now, what makes us primates, it covers a couple of different uh, features. For one thing, we don't have claws. Like if you have a dog or a cat, you know, uh, or even a bird, dinosaurs, they've all got claws, right? Well, we have, you know, fingernails. And with a couple of exceptions, all primates have nails. We've lost our claws for whatever reason. 
Right, I see a couple of you got some fingernails. So, now, those thumbs are a really important defining feature. Cats, dogs, bears, squirrels, they don't have thumbs. Now, primates, we've all got thumbs. A lot of primates actually have toe thumbs too. Their, their feet, you know, can't see mine. Their feet have prehensile thumbs. And what that means, prehensile, means they can grab stuff with it. Now, another feature of primates that uh, makes us very distinct, separate from other groups of mammals, is our eyes. Now, uh, I'm not going to take my eyes out because it'd be really gross and they're hard to put back in. It's don't want to see that. But behind our eyes, we have bone almost all the way around. They're encased in a protective layer of bone. Um, primates all have some kind of bone casing around the backsides of their eyes. It varies depending on what type, but it, uh, it helps support the eye. And our eyes are forward facing. So we can judge distance. We can see where we're going and tell how far we can walk before we walk into a tree, right? Now, a lot of different animals are included in the group of primates. Things like lemurs, tarsiers, eye eyes, monkeys, apes, and what we're going to talk about today, hominids. Now, there's an important distinction before we go any farther between monkeys and apes. Now, all of us, we are hominids which is a very specific type of great ape. Great apes are separate from monkeys because unlike monkeys, we've lost our tails. Now, I don't know, maybe, maybe one of you has a you know, prehensile tail back here where you can you know, grab onto something with your tail. I don't. You're not supposed to, so hopefully not. Uh, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, gibbons, and humans have all lost our tails. Now, uh, if you watch um, monkeys or lemurs, things like that at the zoo, you'll notice they all have tails. Some of them, uh, say like spider monkeys, for example, are even prehensile tails. They can wrap the end around and grab onto stuff really hard. Um, actually, most of those uh, you know, tree-dwelling monkeys that have a prehensile tail can hold on so tightly with their tail they can actually hang just by their tail from the trees while they grab other stuff with their hands and feet. Now, the first thing we're going to talk about today, I introduce you to this, uh, this big fellow up here behind me, him. I'm going to go grab him. Now, this, this is the skull of a very close relative of modern humans. Now, uh, this is the skull of a gorilla. Now, because of uh, endangered species and protected species laws and a, a number of other reasons, uh, this skull and the next skull that I'm going to show you, they're replicas. Um, we didn't actually go out and collect a gorilla skull for this but it is an exact replica, an exact model of a real gorilla skull. It's actual size and it shows you all of the features that uh, define it as a gorilla. Now, there are a couple different kinds of gorillas, but uh, for the sake of today, we're just gonna focus on two. There's lowland gorillas, which they're, uh, they're pretty big, they're pretty strong and they live out in lowlands, you know, uh, sort of the, the jungle gorilla that you'd think of in like a Tarzan movie. And then there's uh, mountain gorillas. And mountain gorillas are generally what we think of as the, the quintessential gorilla. They're, uh, the males at least can be very large, they're extremely powerful animals, and they're very smart. But uh, unlike, say, King Kong, uh, they're, they're herbivores, they're plant eaters. So you look at this guy's teeth, he's got these big fangs. Now, hominids, uh, you and I, we don't have big fangs, right? You guys have big fangs, no? So 
as a plant eater, this gorilla is not using these big fangs to, uh, you know, attack other animals to go after meat. He's using them to show off to other gorillas. Now, like us, he's got two eyes in the front facing forward. But unlike us, if everybody will, will feel the top of their head, you remember last week when we talked about Ice Age giants, the, uh, the wolves and the bears, they all had that crest of bone along the top of the skull. Gorillas have that too. And I even have an extra one along the back here where all of this is muscle. And that muscle attaches to the lower jaw here for chewing. These gorillas, they eat really tough, dense, hard, fibrous foods. They actually spend most of their day just sitting around eating salad. They'll eat termites and bugs and stuff like that sometimes, but they really don't eat meat. That is not the case for this fella. This is our closest living relative. This is the skull of a young male chimpanzee. And you can see again, it's got those large forward facing eyes and inside the eye sockets, you can see like I was talking about, it's all bone in here. That helps to support those eyes. Now with the chimpanzee, you can see he's got big fangs, right? And we don't have those. For the chimpanzee, it's the same as for the gorilla. It's just to, to look big and intimidating. It's for showing off for fighting other, uh, other chimpanzees. Now, chimpanzees and their close cousins, bonobos, are very, very intelligent animals. They, uh, they're actually one of the few animals who will recognize their own reflection in a mirror. Um, if you put, uh, say, your cat or your dog in front of a mirror, they'll sniff at it and try and figure out, you know, where'd this other cat or where'd this other dog come from? They don't recognize themselves like, like you and I do. Chimpanzees and even gorillas can recognize themselves. They, they understand that they're separate from their reflection, which is a really interesting, unique characteristic. And like the gorilla, our chimpanzee here has a little bit of a, a sagittal crest. They have a very powerful bite. Both chimpanzees and gorillas are actually very, very powerful animals. If I was to uh, try and arm wrestle a chimpanzee, even though the biggest of them would barely be my size, I wouldn't stand a chance. They're extremely strong. And like I said, very intelligent. Chimpanzees have very complex social behaviors. Uh, like us, uh, they, they interact, they, they talk with each other in, in their way. Uh, they communicate very effectively with each other. They work cooperatively as groups. They learn very, very quickly, and they actually teach each other. Um, they are, well, like us, uh, they're tool users. Now, there's several different types of animals that use tools, even some birds and uh, uh, you know, uh, other primates. Um, but chimpanzees, they, they really take it to, uh, to the next level. They'll use sticks and rocks as hammers to crack open nuts or to break open ant nests or termite mounds. And though they eat a lot of fruit and a lot of plants, most of their diet is, is fruit and plants, certainly more than most people. They hunt, they eat meat, they eat a lot of bugs, uh, you know, a lot of grasshoppers and ants and termites, and they'll make very special tools. They'll take a, a stick and shape it in a very particular way to stick it in the ant hole or the termite nest and pull bugs out. They'll use uh, sticks and rocks as clubs, as bludgeons when they're fighting off, uh, say, leopards to defend themselves. And they've even been witnessed and videoed using sticks with sharpened ends as spears to hunt a type of monkey. They'll actually corner it and chase after it with a spear, just like our ancestors would. Now, chimpanzees, uh, they don't know how to use fire, right? Unlike us, they don't uh, go roast their steak over the, the grill or, you know, fry an egg on the stove. They just eat it raw. But uh, 
where that would make us very sick. Chimpanzees are a little tougher than we are. Uh, but that said, it's even been noted now that chimpanzees, when they're not feeling well, uh, have learned how to make and use their own medicine. They actually have medicinal plants that they'll take if they get a, a bellyache. So really impressive. But chimpanzees and gorillas, they're really different than us. You know, if you go to a, the zoo and you stand in front of the, the chimpanzee exhibit, you know, the chimps will come up and they'll look at you and right. But, but they're, they're different. They're not us. Now, sometime around three and a half to four million years ago, we had a common ancestor. There was a, an ape that evolved into chimpanzees and eventually into us, kind of along separate lines. And right about that time, we started getting all of these back behind us. Now, the first one we're going to talk about is, uh, well, it's probably not related to us, but it's still really fascinating. And it's a very close relative to somebody who is related to us. Now, all of these skulls that we're going to talk about here, all of these tools, all of this behind me, like us, these are all hominids. Now, hominids are great apes, just like the orangutans, chimpanzees, gorillas we were just talking about. But we walk upright on our back legs. Our feet have changed from this sort of hand shape that you see with the uh, chimpanzees into what you have on the bottom of your own leg. And by this time, by about three and a half million years ago, We've actually found tracks, fossilized trackways, where a couple of these, uh, these hominids walked through uh, fields of volcanic ash and left their footprints in mud that turned to stone, and they walk just like us. Now, looking at their skeletons, we can tell because of the shape of their hips and some other details, they weren't quite as good at it as we are, but they were a lot better at it than any other ape had ever been. Now, this fellow here is called Paranthropus boisei. And Paranthropus is very closely related to our early ancestors, but there's, uh, there's a few differences here. For one thing, he's got that sagittal crest up top. And if you look, his cheekbones are huge. He could imagine the face of this fellow as looking a lot like an orangutan sort of the wide, almost flat looking face. But he's still got those forward facing eyes. Like us, notice no fangs. See? He's got very, very human teeth. Now, Paranthropus, uh, we don't think was directly related to us. They were eating a lot of plants, a lot of roughage, uh, seeds, nuts, things like that probably grasshoppers and bugs, but a diet very similar to uh, probably a modern gorilla. And one important detail that sort of puts Paranthropus over here instead of directly behind us is we've, we don't have uh, stone tools that have been found as a direct association with these guys. Now, this is another another Paranthropus skull. So you can see here, his skull is a little mashed up, a little mangled up. And that brings us to an important trait. Now, uh, who here likes sleeping in mud puddles? Just laying down on the wet ground in the mud and just going to sleep there. No, that's good. I do not like that either. And Neither do chimpanzees and gorillas. Neither did any of our ancestors or our hominid relatives. But the problem that that causes us is bones like this, uh, hominid fossils are extremely rare. So 
the, the conditions that are required to make a bone into a fossil, generally they're inhospitable. They're wet, they're muddy, um, fine silt and clay has to fill in around the bone and then it gets buried. And over thousands and thousands of years, that bone turns to rock, turns to stone. Well, if uh, our Paranthropus robustus here doesn't get washed into a creek or a river or a lake and buried in mud, well, they're not sleeping there. Their bones aren't going to end up there. They're not living there or hanging out there much. Um, and of course, if that happens, they have to be buried before the scavengers eat all of them because uh, when uh, our ancestors were walking around, lions, hyenas, uh, you know, leopards, crocodiles, all kinds of stuff were going after these fellows. So these fossils like this are really rare. They're really hard to find. And good, complete ones, like what we're going to be talking about here today, are even more rare. Ow. Now, behind us, I move a little back so you can see better. So back behind me here, I have three skulls that are all very important to us being here today. They're what we think, with the information we have right now, are our direct ancestors. And one of the reasons we think that is because we find tools like this associated with sites where we find these hominids. Now, this, this may not look like much, but this is a huge step forward, a very important piece of technology. There are three technological advancements that humans use that no other animal that we've yet encountered has learned how to use. And that's cordage, something as simple as your shoelaces to tie things together. A lot of birds and stuff will weave things together. Of course, bugs make their own string, but nobody else in nature makes cordage like we do. The use of fire, which we're gonna talk about more in a little bit, and sharp cutting tools. Now, this is what we call an Aldawan chopper. This is the first really truly refined tool that our ancestors made. And this, this is what we call a spheroid hammer stone. Uh, spheroid because it's ball shaped, hammer because you hit stuff with it, and stone because, well, it's a rock. And what they would do is find a rock like this, nice round river rock, and they'd find a stone, it's kind of a smooth, cobblestone like this. They show up in riverbeds. You can even find stones like this right here in Wisconsin. And they would very carefully hold on to this and hit it with that hammer stone and break off flakes that look like this. Very, very sharp. In fact, this flake of stone is so sharp that if I wanted to, I could shave my beard off. But when I get home, cave wife wouldn't recognize me and I'd have to sleep out in the backyard with the mammoth. And so we're not gonna do that today. But by intentionally and carefully breaking off flakes from this river cobble, they had the first knife. They were able to use this to cut plants, to cut meat, to get into things, uh, food resources that would otherwise be unavailable to them are really, really impressive ancestors that did that were known as Australopithecus. So this, this is one of a couple of types. And you notice, like with our Paranthropus, he's, he's gone and lost a uh, part of his head here. He's missing, missing that half, right? Good look for me. Now, uh, this is Australopithecus africanus, and uh, we don't think africanus was directly related to us, but we've learned a lot of neat things about this time period from them. Um, africanus was around between three and a half million and two million years ago. Um, now, I'm about five and a half feet tall, if I stand up here, and these guys, they stood about this tall. They were no taller than most of you watching. 
uh, really roughly the size of a modern chimpanzee, except they had feet and legs a lot like us. They stood and walked upright. Now, a uh, little bit of neat trivia for you. Australopithecus africanus was the first hominid species described by science in 1924. It was also the species that we have the most complete fossils from. We have a skeleton that is 90% complete, which is almost unheard of in human uh, hominid fossils. Now, the, they're, they're kind of a weird ancestor. So they have features, Australopithecus does, of both human and ape. And what that tells us is that they're uh, what we call a transitional species. They're part way between that chimpanzee and us. So, well, it also tells us, uh, I don't want to say that they, uh, they spent a lot of time climbing. They had really strong arms, kind of ape-like shoulders and upper body, but hips and legs and feet that were more closely related to us. They were spending a lot of time on the ground walking upright. Now, from looking at their teeth, we think that Africanus here um, would eat grasses and grass seed sometime, which I wouldn't suggest you eat grass. It's really hard on your teeth. Um, we know they were digging up tubers. So uh, things like potatoes and carrots. You guys like French fries? Yeah? Yeah. Australopithecus would have loved French fries. Absolutely guarantee it. We think that they were eating insects and bugs, you know, things like uh, ants and termites, like chimpanzees. And there's some evidence that they were getting some meat too. So you can imagine these as behaving and living very much like a modern chimpanzee. Now, because of the grasses and the grass seeds in their diet, we think that they were living along the edge of the forest on the, on the grasslands. But uh, that comes with a lot of danger so if you, if you watch TV shows about Africa today, you'll know there's lions, leopards, hyenas, um, you know, there's all kinds of predators, right? You go near the water, there's huge crocodiles. Africa just, it's full of stuff that wants to eat you. There was even more of that back then. One really neat fossil of Australopithecus that we found a while back, um, excuse me, it's known as tongue child. And Tong Child was very small, uh, you know, two feet tall. It was a young Australopithecus, um, probably just a couple years old, just old enough to be wandering around away from its parents kind of on its own. And Tong Child was eaten by a predator. The, the bones we found from it were in the mouth of a cave that was underneath a big tall tree. And when it was first discovered, we actually thought a leopard got this Australopithecus and carried it up into the tree to eat it. Because modern leopards do that all the time. Uh, because things like lions and hyenas either can't climb or can't climb well, leopards will carry uh, antelopes and uh, you know, deer and things like that way up into the tr trees so that they can eat without being bothered by other predators. Well, when we more closely analyzed the wounds, the, the bite mark, what we thought was a bite mark on the skull, we actually found that Tong Child had been carried off by a giant eagle, a bird with probably a 10 foot wingspan. And the holes on the skull that we thought were leopard teeth were actually from the foot claws of a bird grabbing the poor guy by the top of the head and flying away with him. So if, if you're an Australopithecus walking around three and a half million years ago, not only do you have to watch out for lions and hyenas, but you got to keep an eye on the sky and watch out for birds the size of a car. Hey, would you guys want to deal with a bird like that? I know I don't. And I like birds. Now, another, uh, another real neat trivia piece here. This is another skull from an Australopithecus afarensis. Uh, we call her Miss Plez. Now, this skull was an early discovery. And uh, paleontologists, uh, people, the scientists who dig up uh, dinosaur bones and hominid bones, fossils, uh, were very, very careful today. If we find a bone 
like this that's uh, encased in rock will actually cut out a huge piece of rock, hundreds or thousands of pounds of stone, ship the whole thing as one piece back to the lab, and then spend years very carefully cleaning all the rock off and getting every single piece of bone. And by doing that, we can learn a lot. But in the old days, uh, scientists weren't quite as patient. This skull was found buried encased in solid stone and the paleontologists that found it started digging it up and they got a little impatient. You'll never believe what they did. They used dynamite to blow up the rock to get the skull out. So you can see these, these parts here. Those are, are patches, they're not pieces of fossil because this poor skull was blown up with dynamite to get it out of the ground. Could you imagine digging a hole for a fossil with dynamite? Yeah, not even a T-Rex would last through that. Now, this next skull here. This is Australopithecus afarensis. And this is a particularly, um, particularly important Australopithecus. This is Lucy. Now, uh, Australopithecus afarensis here was walking around the same time as Africanus, and their names are similar. They're easy to get mixed up. Um, but Lucy, Lucy's really fascinating. Um, she was a fairly complete skeleton. She gave us a really good fossil uh, representation of legs and feet, and so we know they were walking around very much like us. Now, we are pretty sure because of these, of these stone tools, some of these associated finds, that Afarensis here, Lucy, was directly related to us. Now, uh, Lucy in particular was uh, about three and a quarter million years old. So she was walking around a long time ago, not quite the 65 million years old that dinosaurs were, but Still a very long time. Um, now, Lucy was discovered uh, by a, a group of researchers that included a fascinating woman named Mary Leakey. Uh, now, for next week's program, uh, the program is going to be Women of Science. We're going to be talking about a dozen or so women that have, uh, over the past couple hundred years, that have made amazing discoveries uh, that have affected how modern science understands the world that we live in. And uh, Miss Leakey is going to be one of the ladies we're talking about. Uh, but today, we're going to talk about her discovery, Lucy, here. Um, and actually, uh, <laughs> I, I'm told Lucy was named for Lucille Ball from the old I Love Lucy show. Um, now, as I said before, we have fossil trackways from uh, Afarensis, from Lucy's relatives walking through lava, uh, ash fields from volcanoes. So we know what their feet looked like. We know how they walked. We know from those same trackways that adults and young were living together, that they were, uh, they had the same kind of complex social structures that chimpanzees do. Um, and Lucy, the Australopithecus, they were, they were small, about the size of modern chimpanzees. She was only three and a half feet tall. You know, I'm sitting in a chair and she would be right about this tall, right? Now, uh, we found some skeletons that are a little bit bigger. We think like modern apes and modern hominids that the males were probably a little bit bigger than the females. Uh, the reasons for that are gonna vary depending on different groups. Um, we know that they walked bipedally, they walked like us, but they weren't quite as good at it as we are. Uh, you know, humans have been walking upright for a very long time. Uh, like our uh, Africanus that we talked about, Lucy was a transitional species. Uh, she had what we call a mosaic anatomy. She had arms that were longer and stronger like an ape's, but she had feet and legs like ours. Um, we, we know uh, that Lucy spent some time in the trees. And we actually, uh, we have well, really proof of that because uh, some of Lucy's bones were broken and uh, she was getting up there for a, a wild ape. She was in her late 30s, early 40s when she died. And uh, 
when we first found the skeleton and looked at the bones, we know that uh, her bones were fossilized on the shore of an ancient lake. And so we, we thought that she probably went down to the water and you know, to get a drink uh, and died there and got buried in mud. And the bones got stepped on by hooved animals, uh, things like wildebeest and antelope. But more recent analysis of how those bones were broken and what bones were broken has actually showed us that Lucy here fell out of a tree. The broken bones that she had were consistent of somebody falling from 30 or more feet. And so we think, for whatever reason, she was up in a tree over this lake shore and fell. And that's what killed her and how her bones ended up being fossilized. Now, Australopithecus, like Lucy, uh, they, were, they were omnivores. They were opportunistic eaters, uh, like hominids tend to be. Uh, and their diet varied a little bit based on where they were, but they pretty much ate everything. Seeds, nuts, fruits, tubers. Uh, Lucy would have loved French fries. Um, and because of their tools, they were able to get at meat. We don't think they were hunting yet, um, at least not any more than modern chimpanzees do. But with those stone tools, they were able to get at a very important resource. Now this, this is a bone from a buffalo. And inside this bone, you can see it's a very big piece of bone. Inside this bone, it's hollow. And that hollow, it's actually bigger than my finger. It's a it's a big space. Now, when that bone is fresh off of the buffalo, it's full of something called bone marrow. Now, most animals uh, have a hard time getting at bone marrow. Bears, wolves, lions, stuff like that, they can crack these bones open with their teeth and, uh, and get to it if they're hungry. Hyenas certainly can. They have very powerful bites. Well, Lucy here, she couldn't bite any harder than we can. You know, she she didn't have that sagittal crest. Her skull was getting big to make room for brains, uh, not for bite. And so learning how to use those stone tools allowed them to crack this open and eat the fatty, gooey uh, marrow out of the middle of the bone. And because of that, we think that they were able to get nutrients and fats, things that their brain is literally made of, our brains are made of, and that allowed their brains to kind of grow and they got a little bit more intelligent over time. Now, because hominid fossils, hominid bones are, are so difficult to find, the next step after Lucy, we call Homo habilis, is very, very poorly understood. We don't have a lot of fossils of it. And in fact, the museum here, Colossal Fossils, we don't have a Homo habilis bone. Homo habilis was acting a lot like Australopithecus, but they were getting a little better with their tools and a little better with, with hunting, with finding food. The next step after Homo habilis was the first hominid that we would really recognize as being human, Homo erectus. So Homo erectus means upright man or upright walking man. Um, they showed up at first around two million years ago, and they lasted on Earth for one and a half million years. Now, no hominid has been around as long as Homo erectus was around. Human beings, modern people, just like you and I, uh, the oldest fossils we have from us are only 300,000 years old, a little bit more, 310. Nowhere near a million years. Homo erectus totally had us beat. And what's more, not only were they the longest lasting hominid species, but they were the most widespread. Homo erectus made it from Central Africa, north and south across the entire continent, up into Europe, through the Middle East, all the way over to Asia and down into the Indonesian archipelago. Homo erectus spread over half the globe in their time on Earth. They were very, very smart. Uh, they stood uh, straight upright. Their spines, their hips, their legs were shaped 
almost exactly like ours. They were very efficient walkers and we think very good runners. If you took a Homo erectus and you put him up against a, a modern marathon runner, odds are that they could not only keep up, but maybe even surpass that runner. I'm going to show you why. This is a Homo erectus leg bone. Now, this is a left, uh, left leg. So it would be right here. There we go. And as you can see, it is longer than my left leg. By about that much. The hip joint here, relative to a, a normal person, it's big. The knee joint is huge. And on the back of the, the leg bone here is this ridge of bone for muscle attachment. These guys had really powerful legs. We're pretty sure that they were running around, they were jogging all over the place. Now, this, this is an important detail on this bone. We're gonna come back to that in a minute. But before we talk about that, uh, so Homo erectus, they had the same shaped hands that we do. Their, hand, their fingers weren't longer like apes. Their arms weren't longer. You know, they weren't walking around like, like a chimpanzee. They were walking around like us. We think because of some genetic evidence that Homo erectus was the first of our ancestors that wasn't covered in fur, like an ape, like a gorilla or a chimpanzee, but actually was bare skinned like us. Now, obviously some of us have a little bit more fur than others, but one of the, the protein structures in Homo erectus DNA that we've been able to recover indicates that Homo erectus was able to get a suntan. Uh, they were able to produce what we call melanin, which is a, a chemical in your skin that makes it darker in color when you get exposed to a lot of sunlight, and it helps to keep you from getting sunburned. Uh, Homo erectus was able to produce a lot of that. So in theory, that's because they were losing their hair and getting their skin. The reason we think that happened was because as they're running around and getting really hot in the sun, without that extra fur, uh, they can sweat and lose heat faster so they can cool themselves. Because hominids, humans, uh, were really, really good at endurance, at going long distances. Most animals don't do that very well. And we actually think that that's how Homo erectus was hunting. And they were hunting large game. We think that groups of them with, uh, say, clubs, sticks like this, probably even sharpened spears, uh, and stone tools like this, were actually running after antelopes and gazelles, wildebeest, things like that until that animal ran so long and so hard and so far that it couldn't run anymore. It was just too tired. And then they would catch it and eat it. And uh, wolves are pretty good at that, but most animals are sprinters. They're short distance runners. Homo erectus and uh, human beings, we just keep going and going. Now, this, this tool, this is a real, one and a half million year old Homo erectus made tool. This is what we call an Acheulean hand axe. And this is a very important invention. Now, Acheulean hand axes were sort of the Swiss army knife. They're like the multi-tool of the stone age. And people were using these all the way up into uh, our beginnings until fairly recently. They were using versions of this hand axe. Now, some of these were so well made and so well crafted that we can actually tell whether the maker, the user, was right-handed or left-handed. Like this one here, it's got a thumb groove. His hand was a little bigger than mine, but it's actually got a flake taken out right here for the thumb so that you can hold on to it like this. Now, there's a few different ways you can hold these and use these. The edge, the sharp edge, would have gone right around here like that. And you can use it like a knife, 
You can use it like a, a scraper for making stuff out of wood. Um, there you go. You take the, the edge here and scrape on a piece of wood like that. We call it a hand axe. And most folks think, most folks think it's a hand axe because they were taking and chopping stuff with it. But I've made a lot of these and you can cut down a tree with one. But if you sit there and chop on it, you'll break the edge and it's hard on your hand. It's really more like a knife than an ax. And what's really important to notice about this is that it's what we call bifacial. See the shape is more or less even on both sides. It was worked in both directions on purpose to give it a more efficient cutting edge. Our modern knives and saws and tools have that same kind of bevel, that same angle to them. Now, in several weeks, uh, I wanna say it's the third week in November, we're gonna be doing a program where I'm actually gonna show you how these are made. We're gonna do some flint napping right here. And we're actually gonna do a series of these programs uh, in coming weeks where I'll, I'll be showing you how our ancestors made and used these survival tools. Things like flint uh, hand axes and uh, fire by friction, all kinds of neat stuff. But a neat detail about this, we know that these were made intentionally. We know that they were carried with the person who made them. And we think that uh, not only was this a tool in and of itself, but it was also what we call a core, where if the fellow who made it needed a smaller, sharper edge, they could actually take that big piece, hit it with the, the hammer stone, and break off a little flake for fine cutting work. It was a very versatile tool. They would use them for digging, for cutting, for scraping, for getting into bone marrow. Some of them, were fairly large. Most of them were about that size or like this one, a little bit smaller. This is a um, replica that I made and it's very, very sharp. It's really just like a steak knife. Now, because they had that quality of tool, Homo erectus was able to do things that no other hominid, no other animal before us has done. Homo erectus was the first hominid to take control of fire. They cooked a lot of their food and they ate well. There are uh, sites that are Homo erectus sites where we have bones from wild boar, from bovids, things like buffalo and wildebeest, uh, from zebras, from hippos, from rhinoceros, from elephants. These were people that are the size and shape of us and they were hunting down elephants already. One site, we found 55 different types of food. We found fruits, nuts, tubers, vegetables, amphibians, reptiles, things like frogs and turtles, um, invertebrates, bugs, crayfish, stuff like that. And uh, when they were near the water, they were even eating crocodiles. Can you believe that? Would you want to eat a crocodile? But they'd be tasty, just hard to catch, right? But Homo erectus was doing that. They were really good hunters. And like I said, they took control of fire. We aren't really sure when they started making it or if Homo erectus started making it. We think that the, the very first uh, individuals to control fire uh, came across a grass fire or a wildfire, like what's happening out west right now. And they took some of the coals or some of the fire from that and brought it back to their camp and kept it going. But fire was one of the most important inventions or tools of early humans. It gave us light after dark. It allowed us to stop sleeping in the trees like Lucy and to sleep on the ground, uh, but safe from predators. It kept us warm and cold nights and dry and wet weather. And 
it, it was a place for the, the group, for the social structure to sit around for people to talk and to learn from each other. And Homo erectus was definitely learning from each other. When we get to making these in a few weeks, you'll see it's a very complicated process. It's a simple tool by modern standards, but it takes years to really get good at making something like this. And so they were teaching their kids how they did it. Now, as far as, uh, uh, as far as the other first, uh, sorry, I lost my place here. Homo erectus, uh, as I said, they were the first to leave Africa. They went to Europe, they went to the Middle East, they went to Asia. Um, their descendants in Indonesia, a couple of them got caught on islands and isolated. And because of the lack of resources on these islands, they actually shrunk down from as high as six feet tall to about three and a half feet tall. They were Lucy sized. Uh, we actually call them the Hobbit peoples because uh, they were like the Hobbits from Lord of the Rings. They were short little guys, but those were Homo erectus ancestors. Uh, there are places that we have evidence that it looks like Homo erectus was building huts. Uh, things that we would recognize today as a, as a grass hut or made of sticks, maybe bark, possibly even animal hide. We, we don't know. We don't think Homo erectus was really making clothing like this quite yet, but um, in some of the places that they got to up in Europe and in uh, northern sections of Asia where it's colder, there's a good possibility they had to do something to cover up to keep warm. Uh, because of where we find Homo erectus uh, traces, tools, things like that, we actually think there is a possibility that Homo erectus was the first of our ancestors to cross open water, to go out into the ocean and get into islands and places that are uh, a little difficult to swim to, if you will. And Homo erectus were a lot like us. They were actually taking care of sick members of their groups. Now, come back to this guy here. Remember I pointed out this lump on the bone? Now, I hope that none of you have a lump on your leg bones like this, because it would be very, very uncomfortable. Uh, this is a leg bone from a Homo erectus called Java Man. And we think that this particular Homo erectus was eating food near where a volcano erupted. Um, we think that this, this growth on the bone is a form of osteoporosis called Paget's disease uh, that is caused from uh, what's known as skeletal fluorosis. I hope I'm pronouncing all of that right. Uh, skeletal fluorosis is what happens if you get toxic levels of a chemical called fluoride uh, in your diet. And we actually see this sort of thing happen, um, particularly on grazing animals. Uh, or animals that are eating a lot of grass and fruit and vegetation near where volcanic ash has fallen down. Because the ash will have all kinds of uh, chemicals and compounds in it that we wouldn't normally encounter. And it causes this, this bone growth like this. Now, uh, a bone growth like that would have prevented uh, Java Man from doing much running or from, uh, from living very comfortably, probably died uh, from that, that condition. Now, another skeleton of Homo erectus that we found, uh, the poor old guy lost all of his teeth. Nothing like that. Uh, I believe he had one tooth left in his, in his skull. Uh, because of that, he couldn't chew his food. And we think he was probably old enough that uh, he wasn't running very quickly anymore. He would have had a hard time getting food on his own. Well, we don't know if he lost his teeth from infection, if it was cavities, you know, from not brushing his teeth, or if he got into a, into a fight or got, you know, hit and knocked him out. But we know that they healed. Uh, the tooth sockets were, they weren't freshly lost when he died. And what that tells us is that somebody in his group was bringing him food. They may have even been using a, a rock to mash it up or even chew it up for him so that he didn't have to chew his food. And and a couple of, uh, of bones, we've even found evidence of vitamin A poisoning. Now, vitamin A poisoning is interesting because uh, you get it from eating too much liver, particularly liver from predatory animals. And all that tells us first off that Homo erectus was the first on the scene for that meat. 
because predators like lions and hyenas, they eat the liver right away. Uh, it's full of minerals, nutrients, fats, good things to, to help you grow and stay healthy. I like liver, it's delicious. Homo erectus, if they were getting the liver, that tells us they were probably killing the animal whose liver they ate because they were right there, they got it right away. But these individuals with vitamin A poisoning, they ate too much of it. And they got too much of this vitamin in their system and it causes tissue breakdown in the joints, a lot of bleeding and it leaves marks on the bone. But somebody with that condition uh, they're not going to move very fast. They're going to be in a lot of pain. They're going to be uh, very sick. And so we think their, uh, their troop mates, their friends were bringing them food and taking care of them. Now, uh, after Homo erectus, we get a, a really neat fellow, another hominid we don't have a representative of showing up called uh, Homo heidelbergensis. Heidelbergensis is really neat because they're the first hominids we have evidence beyond all doubt. We know they were using spears. They were using throw sticks, boomerangs. They were using clubs to hunt. We know they were very good hunters. They were eating deer, elk, caribou, horses, things like that. And they evolved into this big fella behind me here. This is a very close relative of ours. This fella here is Homo neanderthalensis. He's a Neanderthal man. Now, Neanderthals first show up uh, about 100,000 years before Homo sapiens, before us. Uh, and they live right up to about 40,000 years ago. The last of them disappeared from Spain. Now, they were a lot like us. And actually, so much like us that if... A Homo erectus and I were standing next to, or, uh, sorry, a Neanderthal and I were standing next to each other and we were dressed the same. Say we both had on a business suit and we got onto a city bus. It wouldn't look weird at all. It wouldn't look different. It wouldn't look like a gorilla, you know, hulking around in a suit. He'd just look like a stocky person. Now, their skulls were shaped a little differently than ours. Their noses would have been a little broader, a little wider. Their chins, you can't see my chin very well because of my, my beard here. Their chins weren't as distinct as ours, a little more rounded. So, you know, you would have had a little trouble doing the thinker pose. But they were so much like us that when our hominid ancestors met them, they recognized each other as other people. We used to think that uh, Homo erectus, or uh, keep doing, saying Homo erectus, that Neanderthal were, were very different, sort of uh, apish cavemen, just, you know, slouched over and hulked around and, you know, carried a club and that sort of thing. But we now know they were very, very intelligent. They had uh, tools just like us. They were using medicine to take care of their sick and injured. One individual got hit in the face, we think probably during a hunt, and it crushed the side of his skull. It squished his eyeball, gave him a serious brain injury. Because of it, he lost the use of his arm and his leg on the left side. Uh, the bones and the muscle atrophied. And that is what it's called. They shrunk away from not being used. But he lived for years with that condition. He survived. And the only way he would have been able to survive is if somebody was helping to take care of him. Because his arm would have been stuck like this. He wouldn't have been able to, to hunt, uh, to get food, uh, to make clothing for himself. He had to have help. Now, if you look at the, the shape of his rib bones here, it's kind of narrow up around the shoulders and wide at the base. So that would have made Neanderthal look very stocky. On a human like me, it's very straight. On them, it's kind of more like that. So they would have, have been rounded. And that's an adaptation for cold weather. It helps them stay warm in the winter. And we think that's because they, they lived in Ice Age Europe. Some of them were as far north as they could go uh, until they hit glaciers. Now, Neanderthals, uh, they made very complex tools. They were still using a version of our Acheulean hand axe here, but they took it to the next level. They were using 
a tool ah. had to find it here they were using a tool making technique that made pieces like this and what they were doing they would actually shape a rock so that when they hit it to take off that last flake that flake would come off exactly the shape they want but the edges on this are razor sharp they're so thin that if the light's shining behind them, you can actually see through the cutting edge. And this comes off the rock in that shape. It's a ready to use knife blade or spearhead. It just mounts on like that. And we call the, the Neanderthal stone tool technique Mustorian technology. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. If you know how it's properly pronounced, I apologize. Um, and it's a variation of what we call Lavalois technology, which again, my French is terrible, so I apologize. And uh, we're gonna talk a lot about that when we get into flint napping in a few weeks. But this, this tool system that they were using was really advanced. We know that they were making and using tools out of bone, things like this, they were very finely crafted. Neanderthal was making and using musical instruments. We were using stuff like this called red ochre to make cave paint. We even have instances where we found that they buried their dead. And because of pollen traces and plant traces, we think that they not only buried their dead, dug a grave and buried them intentionally, but they buried them with flowers and belongings, just like we would, or you know, our ancestors would. So Neanderthal was an, a very impressive group. They were eating just like us, a varied diet, depending on where they lived, ranging from things like woolly mammoth to seafood, vegetables and fruit tubers. We know they were cooking their food. They were able to make fire. And they were the first of our ancestors to make fire using a spark. Something like this. When we talk about fire in a few weeks, we'll give you a good demonstration of this. They would get sparks off of it by striking the rocks together. That is something that even our human ancestors mm -hmm. were using as recently as 5,000 years ago. Now, one last neat little detail about Neanderthal. They were so close in appearance and behaviors in technology to our ancestors, our hominid and our human ancestors, homo sapiens, that when they met, they mingled. And we know that because uh, people from Europe and parts of Asia today, they have DNA from ancient groups of humans. And one of those groups, uh, it's Neanderthal. I myself actually have 3% Neanderthal DNA. You couldn't tell, could you? So some of you might actually be directly related to that fellow behind us. Now, uh, I notice here I'm actually gonna touch past two o'clock. It's a fascinating subject. I just love this stuff. Um, does anybody have any questions about anything we talked about today or something you'd like a closer look at? Yeah, just go ahead and chime right in if you got a question. Do we have a question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, can you show the nice thing again uh, made from bone? Yeah. So this, this is uh, a replica of actually a tool that would be used by Inuits and Eskimos. It's made out of the leg bone of a modern cow. Uh, so not something you'd find walking around thousands of years ago, but the entire thing was shaped and made with bone tools. I'll try and show you here. If I take a flake of stone like that, that has a flat side, I can use it to scrape off pieces of bone. 
So you can see the little bits that came off. And I can actually whittle it and shape mm -hmm. it just yep. like you would a piece of wood. And it's very, very sharp. I actually, uh, I use this one when I go fishing. I use it as my fish knife. Now, it's not as good as steel like or even as stone. It, it gets dull very quickly. But you can take and shape a piece of bone like this to any shape you want. Uh, you can even make jewelry or spear points. Like, that looked like a real knife. Like this. Ooh. Really? And the neat thing about bone, if you have steak for dinner and you're a, you're a caveman, uh, every time you get an animal, you have meat for dinner, you have bone that you can use to make tools. But just like those skeletons that don't last, uh, we don't find a lot of bone tools. We actually call it the Stone Age because most of the evidence we find are stone tools because stone doesn't rot away. If you leave a piece of bone out in your backyard, even things like mice and squirrels will eat it for the calcium. So bone and antler tools are very, very rare and hard to find. But if you went back in time, you would find they were very commonly used, probably more than stone in a lot of environments. So, we we uh, have when we started living here uh, I can't remember when but we we had butt hit the head from the butt I can't remember if it was eight or six we hung in a pine tree a big pine tree the squirrel started to chew the antlers off yep oh yeah whenever uh, whenever I'm making bone tools in the backyard the squirrels come in and they eat all of the scraps they just carry them right up the trees so uh, yeah is it hunter you have a question? Did cavemen fish? They did. Now, uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, I got my calendar here. Uh, the first week of November, we're going to do a program called the Mammoth Hunters. And I'm going to actually, as part of that, go over fishing tools that they used. One of the most common types of bone tools that we find is a bone harpoon point. And these styles, these shapes of harpoons, they were really neat. They're covered in barbs, really sharp. They'd be on the end of a long spear. And oftentimes uh, that spear would be thrown with something like this. A spear thrower called an atlatl. And they would put the spear on the end of that, stand on the shore and use this to throw it really fast and hard. I've actually used that to go fishing. They work very well. Um, I've got about a dozen different styles and shapes from artifacts that you're gonna get to see. Um, even fish hooks. We know that people were fishing as far back as about 35,000 years. And that's just the, the oldest fish hooks that we've found. We've found cave paintings that are even a little bit older of uh, deep sea fish, things like tuna fish and halibut and uh, even seals. So they were absolutely fishing with fish spears. Thanks. Oh, no problem. Do we have any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much for, uh, for joining in today. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed the, the talk. Um, next week's program, like I mentioned before, we're gonna be talking about the women of science. Uh, some really impressive, amazing ladies that have uh, absolutely influenced science uh, as we know it today with incredible discoveries. We're gonna be talking about them and their discoveries and even some uh, some scientists, some ladies today that are still around and still at it, uh, finding actually a lot of things that you will recognize their discoveries. Uh, really looking forward to that. So uh, again, thank you for joining us here at Colossal Fossils and uh, thank you for the great questions. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Um.